welcome back to He's a Giant, a pod about all things Giants football and all things college football. I'm Sal, here with my co-host Monty. What's going on, man? Going on, Sal. You know, good Sunday without having to watch the Giants. That's always a plus. <laughs> it was a p- blissful weekend for once. Yeah. <laughs> Not having to... Conference ship, uh, conference championship weekend. No Giants. Pretty good football weekend. Yeah. Not a lot of Giants talk. Might as well talk about quickly about the conference championship summary. Yeah. I think that's worth mentioning. So, uh, so those of you who didn't see, um, Washington won the Pac-12 championship. They're in. Um, Michigan won the Big Ten championship. They're in. Um, Alabama upset Georgia. Uh, and they're in. Um, yep. Texas won the Big 12 title. They're in. But the shocker was Florida State going undefeated and winning the ACC championship and being held out. And the uh, committee just felt that without Jordan Travis, they had no shot. So screw it. Yep. That was Fair. unfair to them. But, you know, I, I mean, I get they wouldn't have done much probably. But that sucks for Florida State, their players yeah. and their fans. So the the way the game shape out, it's going to be Michigan number one seed against – I believe uh, Alabama is the four seed. Alabama, and that, yep. that that's going to be a hell of a first game. Yeah, um, that's like that might be better like the championship. championship. Yeah, yeah, that might be the championship. Excuse me. Um, and then you got Washington, technically the home game against Texas. That should be a good game too. Um, yeah, Texas is a favorite in that, which surprised me. Yeah, I was a little surprised by that. Um, this is the final year where they have a fourteen playoff, so you know, enjoy it. And we'll see. I mean, it, it probably a year too a year too late for the for the folk for the Seminoles fans. I feel real, I feel for them. This would have been a great year to start the the twelve team playoff because I don't know if I've ever seen like a better like top eight. If you yeah. look at it, like the four we talked about that made it, and then you have Florida State who should have a shot, Georgia who you could say arguably is better than every team in here, um, Ohio State great team. Oregon, great team. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, you got your four, though. So you got a few weeks off. These kids are taking finals. Uh, and then after finals, the, the the festivities get started. But, you know, it's going to be quiet until then on the college football front. Uh, just, so this is part two of yep. our State of the Giants uh, series. Two of two. We're not going any further than this one. Um, no. Thank you guys for all the support again for tuning in for the first episode. Got a lot of views. We appreciate it. Uh, before we go further, you can find us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify. Like and subscribe. We appreciate that. Find me at Sal at Queens underscore guy. And Monty is at Monte Cristo at M-O-N-T-E-C-R-I-5-T-O on Twitter. You can DM us. Some of you guys do. We appreciate it. Uh, but more than anything, we just appreciate you guys. Uh, so episode one was well-received where we went over the coaches. And the state of the coaches. So what we're going to do in episode two is go over the state of the roster. And we're going to do a position by position breakdown the way we did the the uh, the prospect breakdown. Uh, just see where we are in each position group and go from there. So without any further ado, do you want to you kick things off? Yeah, let's just jump into it and you know give us as much time as possible to go over this. So uh, we're going to naturally start out with uh, quarterback. The, the decision. Right, the quarterback room. So, as currently constituted, the Giants only have Daniel Jones and Tommy DeVito uh, on on their roster for next year. Um, a UDFA and Daniel Jones going into year two of his four year deal. He has a a cap hit of I believe forty seven million dollars next year. A dead cap of six sixty nine million. So they would lose cap space on him. Uh, were they to try to cut him? So that's not likely to happen. Um, so those are your two quarterbacks. Um, Tyrod Taylor is a, an upcoming free agent. Joe Shane talked about this at the GM uh, interview he had, the press conference he gave during the bye, where he said, yeah, we got to do something about quarterback because Tyrod Taylor is a free agent. And Daniel Jones may not be ready coming off his ACL tear going into next year. So let's start there. With, obviously, this is a big discussion. What are we going to do here at quarterback? I yeah, mean, I think you've nailed it when you've said it in other shows is that we still have a first round quarterback problem. And I think that's where everybody's eyes are right now is if we're going to address quarterback in the first round. And quite honestly, I think I think Joe Shane has to because right now, 
it doesn't matter how much belief he has in Joe in uh, Daniel Jones. He could still think Daniel Jones is going to be a great quarterback, but at the end of the day, with the injuries that have happened and not knowing if he's ready, and them most likely, you know, being on the hot seat going into next year, you can't rely on a quarterback coming off an ACL injury who relies on his legs to save you your job. Like even if Jones is ready week one, is he going to be the same player next year? Or like, is he ever going to be the same player? Is he going to be the same player just next year? We saw how the ACL affected Saquon Barkley. Like this very much could just be like totally lose them their job if they don't address quarterback. So, I mean, the other alternative route, is they go free agent and get somebody reliable to help hold things over. Not my preference, but the the idea, though, that's tough, is you're paying Daniel Jones $47 million next year. How much are you going to allocate to the quarterback room to bring in like a quality backup? So uh, it's a tough decision. What What's your kind of first outlook on it? I think the easy decision here is is – for you have a first round problem at quarterback, you need depth in the room, you want to add quality to the room, you don't have the cap space that you think you do, especially if you're talking quarterback. The right thing to do is just take a first round quarterback. Um, you know, and not like we've always wanted the top two guys each day that goes by, not going into too much of what's going on in the NFL right now, but it seems less and less likely. That we're going to get access to those two guys. You know, things things can change, but that seems unlikely right now. But we've mentioned here, we've gone in depth into the other guys who are high quality first round talents that'll be there. Uh, whether it's JJ McCarthy, Shadur Sanders, Jaden Daniels, whether you want to take a swing at Michael Penix Jr. at some point. Not that I, I'm a fan of Bonix, but you know, like you could see them doing that. Whether it's Quinn Yours, if he declares, yeah, well, right? Another guy that wrote his stock rose a lot, you yeah. know, this last Saturday. So right. So and and if he, you know, he's gonna get a shot to make it go higher now in yeah. playoffs. This is a guy who, like, unlike other some of these other guys, he's he's gonna play. Like he and McCarthy are playing in the playoffs, so they're not gonna take off the bowl games, obviously. So yeah, um, <laughs> you know, they have options to upgrade the room, and I I, I don't understand why people treat the quarterback room different than other positions. If you have an opportunity to upgrade the room, you should upgrade the room. A hundred percent. That's where it is. Yeah. And we don't have a, a room. Get a cheaper so, option. Yep. We don't have a room so good that we should be easily dismissing the first round quarterback value. Um, now on where we land, we'll see where we land on draft day, whether it's pick three, pick eight, we'll see. Um, and there is a difference in who likely will be BPA technical DPA, whether it's three, seven, eight, whatever. But I will say, if you believe in a quarterback and if you have conviction that that's going to be a starting caliber NFL quarterback, he's BPA. It's almost impossible to find value at any other position that will equal a starting caliber NFL quarterback. And just an average NFL quarterback, right, is worth more than most other players at most other positions as a first-round pick. So we have a first-round problem. I think the simple solution here is take one of these guys You mentioned the free agency route. We have, um, you know, over the track, over the cap and spot track, I've been keeping track of estimated cap space. Over the cap is better. Um, Mm -hmm. They've been estimating the Giants being around like 47 million left with 30 something players on on the roster. Um, I don't know if you saw, news broke this week that a lot of teams are estimating that the cap next year is expected to be significantly lower than they thought it would be. Did you Mm -hmm. see that? No, I didn't see that. So a lot of teams are using a number that's about 15 million lower than they thought it would be. Wow, that so would be big. so I don't know if that's true or not. Um, NYG fan in Charlotte posted it, and he had a link to somebody who's who does a lot of work with the Patriots and saying multiple teams are now using a much lower number for the estimate. I don't know where they're getting it from, but huh? so if the, if that's true and, the, and they're like 14, 15 million less than where they are, the Giants have only like 31, 32 million dollars in cap space. You still have lots of players to fill on the roster. You have to pay for your draft class. You may want to add a quality free agent in another position. Are you really in a position to pay like five, six, seven million dollars for a backup quarterback? It's tough. Yeah. Also, not to mention if you if you went out and tagged 
Saquon Barkley, because some people think might happen. That's twelve million ripped right off the top there. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole that's a whole other discussion. We'll get to running yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, but the the cap issue is going to play into things, you know. And I think a lot of teams, including the Giants, made decisions on how they spent money in the twenty twenty three offseason, thinking they would have more money in twenty twenty four. If that's not true, um, if it's not as true as they thought it would be. That's gonna really put a dent in how teams approach free agency. So keep that, keep you know, watch out for that because that was a quiet big news story that came out this week, and nobody really notices this stuff. But if it's true, it really changes things depending on how healthy your team's cap is. So look, at the end of the day, the Giants have a first round quarterback problem. Nothing has changed. I know everybody's hung up on Drake May. And they're hung up on Caleb Williams. And I would be too. We were yeah. too. We still kind of are. Yeah, but... still a little bit. A whole <laughs> little, like a... A little, leaving the door open. But ask yourselves as fans, are the Giants a better, is the Giants quarterback room substantially improved by having Daniel Jones and Tommy DeVito and maybe some day three guy, you know, or late day two guy, uh, or a free agent like a Trubisky or somebody like that? Uh, assuming he gets cut, he might get cut um, after this year. Or are they in a much healthier place as an organization overall, and specifically in the quarterback room, by having Jones, DeVito, and a first-round quarterback like a McCarthy or a Sanders or a Jaden Daniels? Um, yep. I, I don't think this is really controversial. And I can't think of any other position group that could be more meaningfully impacted by a day one pick. So that's where I stand. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, obviously for me, the best case scenario still is if you can find a way to trade up into the top two picks. Um, I think it's becoming less and less likely every week, as you talked about. Arizona won today, for example. So, you know, that pushes that pushes Arizona back. Um, you know, if, if it's the Patriots and the Bears, top two picks, it's hard for me to see them trading out of it. Maybe, maybe there's a chance if the Bears have that second pick, and there's a huge gap between the first quarterback and the second quarterback. I maybe could see a world where that happens, but I don't want to count on that either. It's just like worth mentioning maybe, but uh, yeah, I mean, ideally I would love to try to trade up, especially if you can get into like the number three spot where you still have like your a Marvin Harrison jr. Sitting there and you can use that as a nice trade piece to get up. That'd be my ideal. Scenario. But outside of that, I still think they should go quarterback in. Obviously, Marvin Harrison Jr. would throw a wrench into that. I think you could trade out of that and still get uh, still get picks, whatever. We won't go go too far into that discussion right now. But I think that there are quarterbacks that interest me. Um, you and I are both big fans of J.J. McCarthy. I know he didn't really open up the offense this week at Iowa, and that's a common theme in this Michigan offense. They don't really ask him to open up. But he has a lot of tools, man. He has He's a very toolsy player. You know, he has – huge arm he can rip the football he has 4-4 speed um and he's 20 years old and if when you have good quarterback developing coaches like we have i think that he is a guy who's just getting better and better and you could bring in here and i think one thing you can say about a, a few of these quarterbacks like i mean jane daniels from all accounts at least since going to lsu is a is a high character guy and i think one thing that this discussion will come down to is when you're taking a quarterback this high and maybe it is a little bit of a reach quote unquote um is you know the same argument you kind of heard with Daniel Jones if you're taking one of these quarterbacks and um you know Shador Sanders been into this he's you know a football family you know he's worked worked his butt off just depends how they like about these guys but if you can trust these these players as people and their work ethic and all that type of stuff, it makes you feel a lot more confident in making that pick and projecting what they will be down the line for you as a quarterback. And that ultimately is going to be a big factor as they go through this draft prospect, trying to identify who might be their quarterback three. But I still have my eyes on a quarterback in the first round at this moment. Yeah, I don't think we see differently on this. Um, there is the possibility, just very briefly, of them <clears throat> punting quarterback to the second pick they take, yep. you know, whether that's later in the first round by trading back into it or truly a second round pick. Um, it's not crazy to see a scenario where they take the best position player available 
um, you know, at between Especially three and five. Free. Yeah, that, we'll get into that. <laughs> um, yeah. And then they're they're drafted high in the second round, and they're thinking either they can have one of these guys fall to them, or just decide to trade up and go grab one of the you know the back end of the first guys. You know, we'll see. But it's a it's a dangerous game. Do you have any more yeah. thoughts on the quarterback position? Like, any other thoughts on how we should be approaching this mentally? I mean, I think it's, you know, worth at least, you know, diving a little bit into the idea of the second round quarterback. And, you know, it's like you said, it's a dangerous game. And ultimately, if you play it right, like, like that's that's what great GMs are made of. Just like knowing how the board is supposed to fall and playing it correctly and getting your guy even even no, you could have taken him earlier. And, you know, if it blows up in your face especially when you're on the hot seat that can like lose yourself a job. But, you know, if, but at the same time, you know, you play it right where you have a guy that you think you're going to go later and you can get them a top end weapon or a top end lineman, however you want to go and still land that guy. He's going to be able to have more success and you're going to have a better player, but it's, it's a tough road to go, but it is a deep quarterback class so it'll be interesting who they're interested in i mean i don't know if they'd want to go after another injured quarterback but michael Penix has a ton of ability and he's going to get a chance to prove in the playoffs mm-hmm. Benewers has a ton of ability and he's going to be able to get a pro- pro- prove in the playoff i don't know if you want to hit your wagon to quinn ewers right now like you're one of him in the nfl he's pretty raw um <laughs> so risky and then there's the Bo Nix, where you're kind of punting on upside, but you know you got a guy who I think you're probably pretty confident will come in and play for you. And I'm not, I wouldn't love that option. It's not that I dislike Bo Nix. I just don't, I just like him here. Um, but I, I won't rule out that being a potential backup option for them if they go in the second round. I'd be very surprised if they took Bo Nix. You think so? Oh, I, yeah. I wouldn't be totally surprised, but I wouldn't be thrilled about it. Second round, maybe. Yeah, um, second round. Yeah, maybe. Um, but I, but I, I still would kind of be surprised. I think there's more talented guys that if you're punting on a day one guy, I think you know you may as well swing for the fences on talent. Um, yeah, but, you know. I mean, they and they did do that with like a Josh Allen. So they clearly like recognize that type of traits in a quarterback. So yeah, I don't know. I w- I would hope that they would bet on traits. I could see them like I could see them getting fast day with like Quinn Ewers if he came out. Um, but uh. Quinn Ewers, may, he may come out. I mean, it, it, if he wins, let's say he beats Michael Penix in a, in a shootout, you know, against Washington and goes to the national title game and the spotlight's on him and he has a good performance there too, you know, considering his pedigree, people are going to say he's put it together. And then he's probably never going to have his stock go as high as that. And yeah. he, you know, he, he may want to just hop, hop, ride that train into, into the first round. Like he could, he could find his way to the first round with that. And he's going to rip up the pro day. He's one of those guys that is going to look great in the pro day. JJ McCarthy is another guy who's going to look really good in the pro day. You know, they both those are both like elite eleven, like performers, which all like seven on seven, and they they're both great at that type of shit. Um, so yeah, man, uh, I would prefer Ewers than Bo Nix to the Giants, but it would Absolutely. be risky. Um. But yeah, I, it'll be interesting how they play it. Like I said, like it 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 depends who's available for them pick one. Like 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 we talked about this earlier. Like I don't want to go too much into this, but like Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to be a top three pick, whether we're making the pick or somebody else is. He will be a top three pick. So that's that's going to be an interesting thing to monitor. Let's move on to. Um, I think that covers quarterback pretty well, I and I think we, we both. I think we land in the same place here and. Hopefully Joe Shane sees it the same way. I think his job is absolutely his head his head coach's job is absolutely on the line with this one. So yeah. um that's the quarterback you can get, to be honest. The next position we're gonna go over is running back. Um so the status of our running back next next uh, year is we have Eric Gray on the roster. Um I think Gary Brightwell is going into his fourth year next year, and he's technically on the roster. Um 21, 22, 22. Yeah, he'll be on the roster. And that's it. So those are our two signed running backs. Deshaun Corbin is currently on the team, uh, but he doesn't have a contract for next year. Um, Saquon Barkley is a free agent again. I just mentioned the cap space situation. You know, um, 
what are you doing here? Are we are we resigning Saquon Barkley? Are we tag are we tagging him for twelve million? Are we giving him a multi year deal now? Or are we just saying goodbye and drafting people? I would be fine with moving on from Saquon Barkley, but I have a feeling they're gonna figure something out. I don't think I think they're willing to use a tag. I don't know. I mean, if something happens to that cap, that might change that plan. But uh I I think that they brought they kept held on to Saquon Barkley with the intention of getting some sort of team friendly extensions. Saquon Barkley can end his career in New York and we can, you know, kind of ride out Saquon Barkley as as part of his offense for as long as he's useful. Um I think that's the plan, but uh what about yourself? I'm gonna stick to my guns. I'd let him go. Um I'm not going to suddenly say that my view on running backs is changing just because he's having a halfway decent year this year. Um, he's having more than a halfway decent year. He's been good this year, but he's had injuries. And that's, you can't ignore that. That's part of the equation with these guys, especially as they get older. And he's playing with a high ankle sprain. He's missed time. He's going to be 27 next year. I mean, he's, he's going to be right on the cusp of where a lot of the modern day running backs are beginning to see significant drop off in production whether it's because of age usage injuries whatever the reason so am i looking to invest a lot of money in that guy nope not me i'm comfortable walking away what do you think we do they'll give him a three-year deal that's right i i i would walk away too but i i think he'll come back i think it will be something like 20 million guaranteed um probably it'll be the, like it honestly it'll be the deal they should have just given him last year yeah it'll you be know, i think it'll be similar they to offered they offered last year um and he'll just you'll be like hey i got this year guaranteed so that's like the extra guaranteed money i was looking for if you add it together he'll justify it somehow um yeah the, but, the funny thing is like if they do that then he basically just took their entire negotiating tactic and flipped it upside down and and to control the situation because the whole point of staying firm on the franchise tag with him was to say I'm I'm walking away from you after this season like or I'll just tag you again but I'm not giving I'm not giving you anything and or, they should know the status of their finances so they're unlikely to tag him again I think or we'll re- renegotiate a contract with with you next year if you can prove you can stay healthy which he didn't right. Um, but they're basically going to ignore all that in all likelihood and just take them. And, and, you know, like they, the test of what they would do came at the trade deadline when he had two games under his belt after coming back from a high ankle sprain, injured, no future contract, teams banging at the door to get him. That's a lucky situation, to be honest, that there were teams that desperately needed him, uh, specifically the Ravens. And they were they were looking for somebody, and like they probably would have coughed up at least a third, maybe a second, to get their hands on him. You know, like they were desperate to get him, and the Giants didn't pick up the phone. I mean, it's just yeah. And that not only that, they discouraged phone calls. They made it clear, like basically, don't call. We we're not we're not moving them. I mean, they did it again, and uh, in any case. I think once they did that, it became pretty clear they're going to give him a multi-year deal. Um, I'd be surprised if they put the franchise tag on him, and I'd be surprised if he walked. I think the most likely scenario is he gets like a two, three-year deal. They'll push the money back, and that'll be the end of that. And they get to watch him decline on their team. I could, yeah, I could see a scenario where they come to an extension that, that we'd be happy with that I wouldn't be like, be like, okay, that's actually a decent price, but we'll say, I don't know. I, I could also see it's a very fine line between that and just being like, that's like way too risky with where he is. So, I mean, let's, let's play this out. The reason I don't see them tagging him is because they're going to want that cap space for something next year, to, yeah. whether it's to try to compete or just to add a good player, right. For the future. They're not going to want to tie up that space in next year's cap for that. Um, so if they're not going to let him walk, you're probably going to push that money back some to some extent over the next couple of years. If you're moving on from Jones after this year, 
that does free up cap space the following year. It makes it easier because you have a rookie deal contract, rookie deal quarterback at that point. And either Brian Dable is still here building something with that quarterback, and you're like, all right, whatever, Saquon's still here making a little bit more on the cap than I care about, but we're still building the roster and we'll just eat it for this year and we can. It's not a big deal. Or Dable's gone at this point because whatever they did failed. They pulled the plug on them. Um, new guy comes in. And he's got one year of dead money on Saquon Barkley, and he's like, whatever, I'm, I'm taking my quarterback, I don't care. So it, I can see how it's just going to work out that way. But do I think it's good football management? No, not at all. I think they should walk away. But then again, I thought that they should trade him, so that, yeah. it is what it is. If, I agree. Whether, whether or not they walk away, there are good, not great, but good running backs in this class who I think will be available – back end of day two, early day three, to mid-day three. And I think that's where they should be targeting a running back. They still need to add somebody to the room. So do um, you want to go through some of the guys again just to refresh our, our listeners? Sure. So, um, you know, one guy I wanted to mention, this was a guy we talked about who's really my my go-to guy. I called him my running back one earlier in the year, and I, I honestly stand by it. He's not a conventional RB1 by any means, but Bucky Irving out of Oregon is a fun, fun player. And when I think of the players that we've been rumored to the Giants in the past, I remember James Cook was a guy. There are some rumors that we like the like a Jameer Gibbs or some rumors that if he fell there, that that was something we were considering. Um, Buck, Bucky Irving might not be an every down back, at least as size would say that. But this is a guy that Oregon lines up outside as a wide receiver got good hands and he is a tackle breaking machine he is a contact balance monster he's got a you know he's got a little bit of alvin kamara type to his game he is just tackle breaking shiftiness contact balance uh i think he would be a fantastic fit as a complementary piece within this uh running uh backfield uh i think he him with another running back could be a deadly backfield. Um, I agree. Um, you know, the the best, the most uh, heralded back in this class is obviously when Blake Corum from Michigan. He's the only guy who consistently shows up in top 50 lists. Um, and I think he will land probably around the 50-ish to 60 range, you know, yeah. on draft day. So I don't think, I doubt anybody goes ahead of him. I'd be surprised. Um, but it's possible. Um, the size but, will be a concern. And the, yeah. He, Injury and that stuff, and the age and that right, but but I don't see the Giants spending like a top fifty pick on a running back. But there are a couple other guys that'll be in this draft class that we've discussed, like Trey Benson, um, whose stock took a little bit of a hit this year, but he's probably in that range, you know, fifty to yep. seventy. Um, the guy to look out for is Braylon Allen. I think that's, that's what I want to say too. Yeah, the, he's a big. The, he's the kid from Wisconsin. We went over him. Yep. Uh, really just, just a damn good running back, good contact balance, good yards after contact. Ran into the most, if I remember the stat, he ran into the most eight plus man boxes than anybody outside of like the, the military schools, right? Yeah. They load um, up on him. And that, keep yeah. in mind, this dude's 19 years old still. He's right. 19. Like he's young. Right. Um, so he's a power back type. I would love to have him. Um, and then Donovan Edwards. Yep, and then Donovan Edwards out of Michigan is is more of like that Bucky Irving type kind of yep. like speed receiver type back. Um, definitely going to go later than these guys. So these are all guys. I mean, you need to start building this running back room, you know, properly and not be one whatever whatever you do with Barkley. You need to start building this running back room and not be dependent on one person. You need to have quality players back there. So I hope they take at least one guy. Maybe sign the UDFA or something after that, but they need to add some some bodies to this room. And the, and this is a build build a running back room type draft. Like this is the type of draft where you'll you you ask ten different people who their top five running back, and all 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 ten of those people will give you five different rankings. Like right, um, because there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good, but there's not a lot of home run great. Yes, and it's, it, it's it's what you look for. It's what you kind of look yeah. for in a running back. There's different flavors like all over the place. There just really isn't bell cows in this class. Yeah, this is a, this is a position where like I can see the Giants, depending on how Joe Shane plays the board, 
if they decide to make trade down to the second round, for example, to pick up extra day, day three picks, um, this is a position where I can see him using those extra day three picks on like an extra running back, you know, where you build the room out. But yeah. we'll see. The Barth beat decision is almost like unrelated to the running back room in the future. It really it's just, is. It's just like the Saquon Barkley position. It's just a separate, it's a separate employment uh, status on the New York Giants. It has nothing to do with football. <laughs> that's a point. Like, in, in some ways, like it's just he's a great football player, but that's it's just, they don't treat it the way I think other teams would treat a running back in the same situation. Yeah. Um, I think that's it for running back. You want to move on to wide receiver? Yeah, let's move on to wide receiver. And we're going to just go quickly through these um, and. You know, you guys have heard a lot of this stuff before, but we want to kind of break down how we would approach it. I, I should mention a running back. There are free agents available again. It's a, it's a decent class again, but I think the free agent we're going to be focusing on is Saquon Barkley. So I don't, a lot of top I don't think line guys yeah. in this class too. Yep. All right. Wide receiver. So the status of our current wide receiver room for next year is here's who we have under contract. Wondell Robinson, Jalen Hyatt, Darius Slayton. And I believe that's it. Um, I guess Bryce Ford Wheaton. Actually, no, he signed a one year contract as a UDFA. He didn't get a three year deal. So, he got a three year deal. No, he signed a one year. I'm almost certain he signed just a one year deal as a UDFA. I'll double check, but go on, go on. But yeah, you can check that. But anyway, he's coming off an ACL, so we'll find yeah. out what his status three is. Years. But it was three years. Okay, there you go. So he's under contract. So, um, yeah. That's all we've got under contract. So Slayton, Hyatt, Robinson, and Bryce Ford Wheaton coming off injury. Nobody else is under contract for next year. And the question is, where are we going with this? And this is where what the Giants do on day one of the draft is going to make a huge impact. If you've been following the Giants game film this year, you know, people are frustrated by the passing game, and rightfully so. But these receivers are getting open. <laughs> Like they're being schemed open, they're getting open. Jalen Hyde is doing everything you want from him to do. He's the, the routes he gets to run, he runs them well. He gets separation and he finds himself open on you know in the vertical plane at the third level. Um he can't force the quarterback to throw him the ball. Um he's proving himself to be at least a high end number two wide receiver. I think that's how I'm looking at it right now. At least a high end number two. Yeah. And no, the great thing, and I this I was pounding the drum for this, is where I really wanted the Giants to address, you know, the wide receiver in the second, third round, is to take a guy who has wide receiver one upside, and I think they did that with Jalen. Yep. I don't know if he'll hit that, but it was a difference with a guy like Wandale Robinson, who I think will be a good player, but at his size limitations, I never was like this guy won't be a wide receiver one. We can't count on that. Well. At all. Like Jalen Hyatt, on the other hand, it's not that we can count on it, but we could, you know, we're, we're not like we have to take one in the first or second round like we've been in the years past. We're like, hey, like we need to address this wide receiver room, but like there's still a world where Jalen Hyatt could, you know, become more of a route runner and, you know, get a quarterback who can get the ball. And suddenly we're looking at a, a wide receiver one on this offense. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibilities for Jalen Hyatt. No, it isn't. I don't think it's likely, um, but I think it's very much still possible. It's attainable for him. Yeah. Um, I, I think what's likely is he just runs the routes he's running and advances his route tree just a little bit steadily. And if he just has somebody who can throw him the ball, he starts putting up some real production. That's what's more likely. Yeah. Um, Wondell Robinson, it's worth noting, has become a very good route runner. Like a really, really good route runner. He's generating more separation than most players in the NFL right now. Um, obviously, he's in the short area, but still, like he's doing his job. I think I he saw gets, a stat that he's getting the most separation right now in the NFL. Uh, he is based on certain metrics, and I yeah. think in terms of total yards, he's fifth or sixth in the NFL, okay. you know, in separation. Um, and he's showing you that when he gets the ball in stride, he's very dangerous. He's still that shifty receiver you thought you were getting out of Kentucky. The issue with him is obviously. You know, he, he has historically small arms and small wingspan. So for you to maximize his gameplay, you've got to get him in stride. It's going to require, like, pinpoint accuracy from the quarterback and getting him the ball. If you're if you're forcing him to stop or reach, or like it's going to destroy the rep. And he doesn't have the contact balance or the strength to fight through contact to get more yak. He's going to get hit and he's going to go down. Um, so 
he's got to be hit in stride with an ability for his legs to do the rest. So I think that's that's one of the limitations with him, but he's still a very good player. They're, the only free agent I can think of that would make a major impact would be T. Higgins. You know, um, and I don't think I don't think he's really going to be a free agent. I think he's going to get franchise tagged. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then they'll figure out what to do with him from there. They may trade him. I think he's a tag and trade guy. Yeah, they might trade him. But yeah, but it'd be a tag. Be a, from, uh, right. Um, if the Giants are drafting third overall, and they're locked out of the top two positions, that scenario is becoming much more plausible by the day. If they get to third somehow. Um, if, like if they lose out, they're probably going to land a third. I think that's possible. Yeah, and yeah, Cardinals and, win one and, more game, and whatever. It's easy to see this happen, and they get locked out of the top two because it's the Patriots and the Bears who are sitting there, and they're like, "Nope, we're taking quarterback." Well, now you're in. That's the Marvin Harrison seat, <laughs> the third, the third pick in the yeah, draft. It is, and the Giants, the Giants are going to have to make a decision on what they want to do. Do they want to? Do they want to? take a quarterback there because they have a lot of conviction on somebody, right? And we don't know how they view these guys. They may be looking at Jaden Daniels, for example, and thinking, we really love this kid. He's a top five, top seven player, and we're going to take a swing at him, or McCarthy or whatever. Um, or they may decide that we could get a lot for this pick, you know, a lot. We get a first. We get some extra day two picks. Let's just trade down like a handful of spots and take it, you know? And and just let somebody else get Harrison. We'll get someone else. Um, or they may just take. I mean, they may just take him. They may just say he's the best prospect in the class. How do we say no? And and figure out the rest. But it is risky. Yeah. No. No. It's the the scary part for if you don't if you want Giants to go quarterback and you don't want them to go Marvin Harrison Jr. The scary part is the best thing for the Giants to do is try to convince us and everybody else they're taking Marvin Harrison Jr. because if they're trading that pick, they want. They want people to believe that they're going to take Marvin Harrison Jr. if you don't come up and get him. So they got to start. If they get the third pick, they got to start selling that they're taking Marvin exactly. Harrison Jr. unless you come up to get him. And they, um, if they're smart, they if they're smart, they will. Like you'll hear, like the Giants love Marvin Harrison Jr. They love, like they're going to take, like that they want him Daniel badly. Jones. They love Marv. They like the day two quarterbacks. Right. Like right, right. They're comfortable taking, but they are not comfortable passing on Marvin Harrison Jr. Like you're going to start hearing stories like that. I believe you will at least. Um, they may take him, but um, outside of him, you know, we mentioned this is a really, really deep, good wide receiver class. That was our first episode. Um, so, yep, Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunes, um, Keon Coleman, Emeka Ibuka, Xavier Worthy, um, Brian Thompson Jr., the other guy from LSU, Xavier Leggett from South Carolina, another X receiver has been rising. Jalen Polk from Washington been rising. Jalen McC- McC- uh, McMillan from Washington has been steadily rising. Um, who am I missing? Like, there's so many guys. Troy Franklin. Uh, Troy Franklin from Oregon. A lot of these guys are going to be there at the top of round two. A lot of them are going to be there at the top of round two. And if you think about yeah. what this wide receiver room, re- le- take a look at this wide receiver room. What does it really need? We talk about this with our friends on Twitter. You got a guy like Hyatt who might be a perfect wide receiver too, who's a vertical threat, right? Speed demon, vertical threat. Um, You got a guy like Wondell Robinson who's already a route running specialist um, and runs in, you know, as a slot receiver on the underneath stuff. What you really need is a guy who can hold the boundary, um, like a true X receiver. Right, somebody who's a big guy on the outside who's going to draw the number one cornerback on the other team and be able to fight and win on 50 50 balls. That's who you need on this team. And somebody who has some right running prowess doing that, obviously. But the thing is, there are a lot of guys who meet that, you know. Um, like for example, Jalen Polk, he 60% of his snaps were on the outside, 40% of the slot, and his, his contested catch rate. Like with something like 53, 55%. I mean, those are like really good numbers. Um, you know, those are like top end X receiver type numbers. He's, I think he was like, what, 6'2, 210, 6'2, 205, something like that. Um, well, yeah, I mean, like 205, I believe. That's a guy you could see plugging and playing and saying, he can play on the outside and he can play on the inside. We can mix and match. Um, Xavier Leggett, big guy, strong guy on the outside. 
Uh, Troy Franklin is a speed guy on the outside, not as good on contested catches, but I, I don't know how much of that is just the way Bo Nix throws him the ball. Um, you know, like I, I'm not sure about yeah. that because Bo Nix is Bo Nix is very Jalen Hyatt like. Yeah, he's very fast and very skinny, and so is um, Xavier Worthy. Like they're both, they're all in the same kind of tier of guys who are like super fast. Worthy's better than Hyatt. I mean, he's a better route runner and he's more explosive, yeah. I think. With, um, but uh, he's still like, he's real thin. But the point is, you can get a quality wide receiver probably at the top of round two, even if you don't take Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors at the top of round one. So I think there's help coming. It's just, I don't know where they're doing it. Yeah. And I think there's going to be guys even going into that second, second rounder or that third rounder. I mean, you have a guy like, I mean, he's more of a slot, but you have like a, a Roman Wilson, who I think is a really good player. You have a, a guy we talked about on our initial one and, and Malachi Corley. I mean, again, a slot guy, but a really good player. Uh, Ricky Purcell from uh, Florida. You have Johnny Wilson, who's just a giant bodied guy from Florida state. Um, A.D. Mitchell, we forgot to mention. A.D. Mitchell from second, yeah, I'm probably be a second That's rounder. Right. I'm sorry, I'm, I forgot he's, him because he's really up there. Yeah, he's in that that like you know top of the second round category. Yeah, Tez Tez Walker from UNC. Like, there's a lot of guys that are going to be highly drafted in this, and I think you know you could get a very good player in the second round. I think you get a good player in the third round. So. It's going to, it's a very, very deep, good wide receiver class. Um, you know, the guy, the teams who are in position to take a wide receiver at the top and, you know, luckily have their quarterback situation figured out, those guys are going to benefit because, you know, Malik Namers, Roma Dunes, Keon Coleman, those guys are, are top of the line wide receivers. Marvin Harrison Jr. is a generational wide receiver. So, um, you know, Teams are going to benefit from those guys, but uh, I think Giants will come away from this draft of the wide receiver, but I don't think it will be as pressing of a need as it's been in the past. I think that they can kind of play play the board for the wide receiver, which is a good thing. Yeah, I would agree. Do you have anything else to add here? Or should we move on to our nope. next route? Yeah, let's go on to All our right. next one. Plowing right through this. Tight end. Um, status of our current tight end room going into next year. We have Daniel Bellinger entering his third year of his rookie contract. He's been solid. Um, and we have Darren Waller still under contract for another couple of years. Um, he right now is dealing with his hamstring injury, which he has now labeled as being a chronic issue. Um, so don't know what his health looks like, but obviously when he's healthy, he's very good. We got those two guys under contract. Um, What are you doing at tight end for this team next year? I'm holding on to Darren Waller. I'm not I'm not moving on from him yet, but at the same time, uh, I don't think you can rely on only Darren Waller. With that said, I think you got a guy like Daniel Bellinger who is a nice like nice backup plan for Darren Waller. Um I would look to add a third tight end. I would like somebody who is more of a an all round player. Because I think we've had issues where we've only, we've had guys like Lawrence Cager, who's only receiver, and then we've had like like Sweeney didn't really play, but like he's only a blocker. Like if we get somebody who's a more all around guy in the draft or you know for agency, I'd be happy with that. But it's not a huge target for me personally. Um, I I don't think it's a great tight end class. Um, if the board falls the way that you know, you like a tight end. I wouldn't be against taking one, but, uh, you know, we've mentioned Brock Bowers. That's an interesting discussion where we land. Um, I'm not a huge fan of taking it just because, you know, we talked about it on our tight end episode where basically if you're taking Brock Bowers, it's either a top three tight end or it's a bust almost. It's not like a wide receiver, well, you take a wide receiver and they're a top 15 wide receiver, and that's still a great pick because a top five, 15 wide receiver is a great player. Like a, the eighth tight end in the league is not anything special. So uh, it's tough. It's tough trying to gauge something like that. But uh, I would personally not 
take that risk. And I don't really see a huge pressing need at tight end right now. What about you? Yeah, I would leave it alone, honestly. Um, the only way I'm I, the only way I'm moving off Darren Waller is if I'm drafting Brock Bowers. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like some of the guys in this in this uh, class. I think they're quality. I don't think they're as good as last year, but they're you know, they're guys that we we went through the group. It's not super exciting, but there's some good players there. So like, you know. For example, Jatavion Sanders. You saw him actually play a really good game this week for Texas. Um, he's a guy that could be a weapon on the offensive game uh, as a pass receiver. He's probably going back end of round two. You know, there's a big drop off. Then you got guys like, you know, AJ Barner from Michigan is probably going to get drafted at some point in this in this class on day three. Um, you know, and he's a blocker who who can catch a little bit. Um, you got one of my guys. Why? So you know. The, that I really like, um, you know, Kate, well, we both like Kate Stover. We thought he's actually been decent this year. Yeah. Um, but you know, Ben Sinat's a guy I like you guys. I mean, I love my, my zero star recruits. He's had a very good year this year. Um, he'll probably be a day three pick. And then, excuse me. Um, Bryson Nesbitt from North Carolina has been a good pass receiver this year. He'll probably be there day three. You can add a player, but we're not talking about like high impact, big time players. We're talking about just yeah. extra guys. So only way I'm moving off our current tight end room is basically for deciding to trade Darren Waller and, and take take uh, Brock Bowers. That's it. To me, it's Brock Bowers or I'm not really messing with this room. Um, and I'm not advocating for Brock Bowers at all. I'm just saying that's that's how I look at it. Um, I'd probably bang on Waller trying to get him healthy one more year, even especially if we had another, a new quarterback. You want, I think, the upside of Waller potential on the field as much as possible. Yeah, you deserve to give that one another shot. It's you know, yeah. it, it might be the same story all over again, but the upside's worth. You have him here, it's worth giving it a shot. It's worth finding out if if your if your quarterback can use him. Yeah. Um and then, you know, otherwise, you know, I would look I'd be interested in looking for agent for a tight end 3, but I just wouldn't spend money. Like I'd be okay with the Adam Troutman's of the world, the Harrison Bryant's of the world, if you can get them cheap, like something like that, just like looking at like kind of the low end here. I mean, um, th- but, realistically, it's going to be a vet man guy. You yeah. know, if they don't, they may, they may draft somebody on day three, it's possible. But for the most part, you're looking at a vet man guy. Yeah, maybe in Alberto, uh, he got released by like the Broncos on the Eagles now, something, something like that, vet man. Um, but yeah, um, not too much to talk about here, man. It just it it I think we we have another year where it's not a great tight end class outside of uh outside of uh Brock Bowers and we kind of don't know what we have in Darren Waller still. So it's kind of kick the can a little bit at the moment, I believe. I think that's where we are. Um which I have no problem with, honestly, at that position. Especially I, with Daniel Bellinger here. Exactly. All right. Let's move on to the O-line. Um, let's start with tackle. So we have Andrew Thomas, obviously, here, under contract for many years to come, playing great again. We have Evan Neal under contract for another two years um, on his rookie deal, not including the fifth-year option, which at this point looks like it probably won't get picked up, but he could potentially have a really good year next year and change that. Oh, um, man. Yeah. Um, we don't have any other tackles under contract, um, like no true tackles. If you ha- they have used Josh Azudu as a tackle, and he's largely proven that he can't handle the position, um, at least so far. So where are we going with tackle? So Joe Shea made it pretty clear that he still believes that Evan Neal is a tackle. Um, so I... I we talked about it. We think a new offensive line coach is going to be in here. I mean, ultimately, they will have a say in what they think Evan Neal's future is as well. Um, but you can't go into next year like expecting Evan Neal to be the tackle over, all over again. You have to have a backup plan. And I think that there's a few ways to go about that. Um, you know, one thing we mentioned was drafting a a guy who's maybe has 
guard tackle versus versatility. We mentioned like a like a Troy Fotno from Washington. He's a guy who might be there with one of those second round picks. That's something worth considering. Um, you know, you could draft a a a tackle with your first round theoretically. People are going to throw around where you know, depending where we're picking, the best player available might be an offensive tackle. You, you could look at um, an Olu or or a Joe Alt, but I don't know. As listening to Joe Shane speak, it, it didn't sound like he's ready to move off of Evan Neal at tackle yet after he, you know, that was one of his first picks he's ever made. I don't think that he wants to give up on that one yet. So um, I know some fans are, are advocating for us to go tackle in the first round. I I would not be a fan, and I I don't think we'll do it. But I you know second round with a guy like Fatanu, I could see. Um, what what's your thoughts on it? Are you muted? Oh, I'm sorry. You my, my bad on that. Um, I was like, I definitely don't want to take a tackle in the first round, even if Evan Neal ends up not being what we want. I'm perfectly comfortable waiting on swinging high on another right tackle this early, just two years after drafting Evan Neal. I don't think you need to do that in round one. And I think it would be a big mistake. And quite frankly, I think the big decision here is who is your online coach? That's going to impact this. And we talked about that, you know, in the last episode, like, or a couple of episodes ago, like I cannot sit here and make a clear judgment on what to do with Evan Neal and this position with Bobby Johnson still under helm. Like you need another offensive line coach, somebody with a really a better resume who can come in and reassess the situation and say, all right, Neil is either the tackle or, and we want to give him another shot or he's just not going to be a tackle. And he's a guard because that does help understand your situation. I'm going to go with the assumption that they think that he can still be a tackle because Joe Shane said so. Um, yep. And I, I actually believe so. Um, Sounded genuine when he said it. Yeah. Um, that gives you two routes of handling this. You definitely need better depth on the on the at the tackle position anyway, and you need people who can play guard. So, um, I think this is all adding up to like what you and I got into when we talked about our offensive line episode. That this is how the Giants should be targeting the position. It should not be looking for a tackle or a guard. They should be looking for a tackle that can play guard um, or projects as a guard. I think that's that's key here. So. In free agency, there's one guy who, you know, you've mentioned him a million times. He's your guy. You know, Michael Nwenu coming out of yep. the Patriots. And he, he he's a great guard, but he's a pretty decent right tackle. <laughs> like, he's not bad out there. He's been playing it. He played it for Sauce. He played it this week. Like he's, been, he's been doing it the last he, couple weeks for him. Like, he's not outstanding, but he's solid as a right tackle. Um, I think he had like so, an 80 PFF grade versus us or something like that. Yeah. He was, I mean, I think he was going up against uh, like Jihad Ward. <laughs> yeah, <fair>. um, but <laughs> or actually, was Aziz, was Aziz playing in that game? I think so. He's still playing. He's just very limited. Okay. Well, on one who's a good player, um, I don't know what he's going to get on the market. I think he's going to get a lot, honestly. Um, yeah. So let, let's see what he's worth. I'm going to look it up because he, he's got to be one of the better players out there. Last time I looked at it, they didn't have any number on like when spot track does those numbers, they didn't have one for a one move for some reason. Um, but yeah, you, you, I mean, you list him as a tackle. I, I had him, uh, I was just looking at overall offensive line when I was doing it, but uh, yeah, man, yeah. I, I, I personally think he'll come in somewhere between like 12 and 14 million. That's my expectation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another guy worth mentioning is kind of in that same mold is a guy, Robert Hunt from Miami. Um, And he is a very good player as well. I know some Miami Dolphin fans and they're very high on Robert Hunt. I see some of the clips of him on Twitter that are circling around. He love he'll just absolutely destroy guys. He destroyed us when he played it, played us. Uh, he put DJ Davidson in hell. Um, <laughs> uh, but he's a guy who played tackle too. He played right tackle his first year in the NFL. 
So he's another player who you bring him in to be a guard, but if things go downhill with Evan Neal, you don't let Evan Neal tank the season. You move the guard that you got out to tackle, you figure out, and then you figure out tackle in the offseason. And you can keep who you have now, or you can continue to move forward with uh, you, you know, a when we were hunt a tackle or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, yep. that's I think that's the route I would move with this. Um, uh, or in the dra- or in the draft. Um, yeah, you know, I think not day one, I would not do this day one, but the three guys who really like perfectly fit what we would potentially be looking for in the draft in that sort of early second round range would be Graham Barton out of Duke. Um, yeah. although I think he he projects more as a center than a yeah, true guard. The senior ball. It's a bit of a weird thing, you know. Like, he's kind of like Zach Tom a few years ago. Yeah. Um, Troy Fano, I think, is absolutely perfect for us. Like, absolutely tailor made perfect for us. It's amazing. Like, Washington has players that are perfect for us on both sides yeah. of the ball. Um, but Fano is absolutely perfect. Like, he, his base is excellent. He has the length to play tackle. Um, he mirrors guys very well. He's athletic. You know, he just may not be quite athletic enough to stick a tackle, especially at left tackle. But I think he can play right tackle in a solid manner. And I think the way he plays the wide base at guard, he's he's going to be a dominant force. So he's a guy that I would actually draft. And just if nothing else, he improves your O-line one way or another. Um, and then the last guy is Jordan Morgan, who, you know, Mike, I really love Jordan Morgan out of Arizona. Yep. He's had another Great. really good year, really good year um, at left tackle. I think he's tackle in the NFL. I don't think he's as high end as these other guys. So he's more of like a boring workman, like solid tackle, but I can see him because he's so technically sound playing tackle and interior line. Um, And he has the strength to do it. So those are the three guys I'd be looking at in the draft. And I think they're all sort of guys you would look at with, with one of those two second round picks. What one other thing I wanted to throw out as a potential option is uh you could bring in like a veteran swing tackle kind of on the cheap and that could yeah. you know with the plans of evan neal starting but you have this guy as a backup and also a backup plan if you run into a you know knock on wood and another andrew thomas injury and doesn't don't let it derail your season um a guy that i would consider that is maybe like a george font he he signed for only $3 million with Houston going into this year, and he's having a very solid year at Houston. Um, or somebody along you know, those lines, I think, would be like, maybe like a, uh, I, I don't know if Dwayne Brown would, would, would sign something like that at this point in his career, but um, something along those lines is kind of a veteran offensive lineman, I think, would be, the, would be a good move. But, uh, I think that one of those swing guards is probably our best scenario because there's some really, really good options, both in free agency and the draft there. They're going to have to spend some money here in the offensive line one way or another, whether it's at a guard, true guard, interior line, or it's a swing tackle or a right tackle. They're going to have to spend some money here. This is a this is a position where I can see the money here being directly used on this position versus Saquon Barkley, depending on how they structure Saquon Barkley. This is an at-risk position, like where they may not be able to improve if they pay Saquon Barkley on the tag specifically. So yeah, it's gonna um, cost similar money. It's it's right in that wheelhouse. So t- I think the optimal thing here is to sign your guy as a swing tackle or a guard who can play some tackle, and then just see how the board plays out on draft day and see if you get good value like late with your second with your second second round pick or something like that. You know, I think that's that's how you want to play this out, but. We'll see. And I do not think that they have a first round offensive line problem, in my opinion. I don't think that's how I would approach it. I think they have a a, they have a red light alert offensive line coach problem, and that has to be addressed before anything. I'll be honest with you, I would probably try to sign multiple offensive linemen this phrase. I'd make one big swing, but I would not be against taking multiple swings uh, in free agency. One other guy I want to mention before we move on is uh, Urza Cleveland. He's another solid free agent ad. He just got traded to the Jaguars. Um, but he has some offensive tackle experience. So I, I feel less confident with him out there. But, you know, it's the same same uh, idea as the other ones we mentioned. 
Yep. I, th- I think this all ties back to like the coach again. I keep saying it, but this ties down back to like who the coach is and what they're what they're assessing what you got. And I, there's no doubt the Giants have to add talent. It's not we're not saying they don't, but the coaching evaluation is going to really make or break everything about this strategy. Yep. All right. All right. That's it for offense. I mean, we yeah. we covered offense. Um, we're an hour into this, so we're flying. For <laughs> <laughs> our standards. Yeah. All right. Let's hit defense. And look, this is all about who is the defensive coordinator. Um, it sounds like Wake Martindale is. It sounds like Wake is not going to be our DC next year. I mean, I'm holding out hope, but not much. Um, I said in the last episode, I think it's ninety ten. He's gone. I'm sticking to that. How about you? Yeah, if not more, leaning towards Wake leaving. Like I, right. I'm leaving. I'll leave a crack, but I don't anticipate him to be here. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you still have to build a good defensive line. You have to get a pass for us. You need to add talent where you can. This is a really good free agency class for defensive players. And the reason for that, as I've mentioned on spaces before, is that this is the draft class um, from the 2019 NFL draft, which was a historically great defensive draft. Like just pl- defensive linemen after defensive linemen went in the first round. Followed by, you know, like some guys in the back secondary, but like just phenomenal players. And most of these guys had their fifth year option picked up and the first rounders. And here they are, finally free agents five years later. So here's some names that are going to be out there on the on the defensive line as pass rushers, specifically as edge rushers. Daniel Hunter, who's absolutely destroying the NFL right now. Just a dominant force on a one year deal at Minnesota. Josh Allen has been a stud. Maybe not like a super stud, but a really good pass rusher in Jacksonville. Brian Burns, who is you know, who who's in uh who, who I think is he might be the best of the batch over the course of his career so far. Um yep. probably staring at a franchise tag. I think more often almost certainly. I don't think he walks, but you know he'll he'll be out there in some capacity. And then Chase Young who's finishing up the year as a San Francisco 49er for being traded for, traded for a third round pick, but he's almost certainly going to hit the, the market as an unrestricted free agent. Um, Montez was on his list, but he re-signed a multi-year deal with the Bears after getting traded there, so he's off. Um, so from an edge rusher perspective, Monty, are you trying to sign one of these guys or are you, are you waiting for the draft? Bottom line, let's just assume for a second Leslie Frazier is your GM. I mean, uh, your, your defensive coordinator. What are you doing? I would love to try to go sign one of these guys. I don't, I like the top end talent at the edge room, and I still need to kind of do more work on these day two, day three guys. Uh, it's seemingly, it seems like there's some guys that are interesting to me, but um, I'm not quite sure about the, the high end talent after, you know, the first five guys or so that we covered in our edge episode. Um, but there's some really good talent here. I don't know who ends up shaking loose. I'd imagine like Josh Allen and Brian Burns get tagged if they can't get a extension done before them. But the interesting thing is Daniel Hunter can't be tagged. When he signed that one-year deal this year, that new contract with Minnesota, basically to show up to camp, he got a raise, and they took away the ability to tag him. And assuming... Andre Patterson is still here. Andre Patterson is the person who kind of advocated to draft Andre Patterson and help or uh, Dan, Daniel Hunter and helps develop him into the player he is today. They they love each other. That very much could be uh, a reason to get him here. Ultimately, you know, Daniel Hunter is looking to get paid. He, he took a smaller contract than his last deal he signed kind of before he broke out. And he's he's going to look to want to get big money. So I don't know if we'll end up in the price that he will cost, if that will be in our price range. But we you know we've talked about this. If we can get a Daniil Hunter with a Kayvon Thibodeau and you have a Dexter Lawrence who commands double and triple teams and still puts up edge rusher type pressure numbers that you could get home with your front four, which Leslie Frazier loves to do. If he's our defensive coordinator, you can get home with your front three front four easily 
with with a group like that. So um, I'd be here for it. That'd be the start of an elite defense with a guy like Dino Hunter. Um, I think he's worth the money. But uh, what about yourself? Yeah, I think that the my view on free agency is that you should always be looking to improve your roster wherever you can realistically make a big impact. And you got to go look at a free agency class and see is there high end talent in that class somewhere and see if you can get your hands on it. It's very clear that the strength of this free agency grouping is the defensive side of the ball for the reasons we mentioned, specifically at edge rusher, pass rushers on the D line. I think it would behoove any good organization to try to walk away with one of these guys. Um, and Hunter might be the he might be the prize because he might be the only unrestricted free agent out there. Um, but yeah, I would absolutely try to pursue Hunter and bring him back here uh, to the Giants with to reunite him with Andre Patterson. Um, is it possible? I don't know. But I would I would happily give him a three four year deal. You know these guys are usually good into their mid thirties. He's twenty nine now. I'd give him that deal. Let him play as a giant till the till his early early thirties. Line him up opposite opposite Kayvon Thibodeau with Aziz as your as your edge three, and you got the makings of a dominant 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 defensive line. So one hundred percent, I would go after him in the draft. Though let's assume we can't get one of these guys. Yep. You you do have to address the position in the draft, and you, you need an edge, too. You really can't get away with an edge three at this point, because Aziz, I'm sorry, you, just, you can't depend on the guy to stay healthy. So I'm looking at the PFF big board. Here is their updated rankings. Laya to Latu, clearly the best in the class. Six overall. Chop Robinson, guy we loved, 11th overall. Jared Verse fell a little bit. Still 13th overall. Dallas Turner has been rising. 15th overall. Braylon Trice has leaped and is now number 18 on the PFF big board. Um, when he was in the, like sort of like the high 30s before. Uh, and then you have JT Tuamalo from Ohio State at 35 now, knocking on the first round. So you have one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Five guys in the first round, six guys knocking on the door total with first round grades. So, I mean, you're talking about losing like the top guys before the second round even starts. And, you know, so yeah. this is tough. Um, when you look at the next batch, yes, JT Tuomolao might be there. Joan Ellis might be there from Utah. Chris Braswell might be there from Alabama. He's, he's another good player that's got come on this year. Landon Jackson from Arkansas, Princely Yuman Melon. I think that's how you say it. Um, but you're now in the next tier. You're now in the next tier. Yeah. So if you don't get one of these free agents, you might miss out on these top guys because it's unlikely you're taking yeah. one in the first round. So, yeah. Like I said, so, um, like I said, the the edge the edge is something that we have to dive into a little bit more. I know we're talking about doing like some guys we you miss type of thing and and go over some more of this class um, that we didn't cover in our initial previews. I think edge is definitely a spot where we'll have to do that because um, I want to get a better idea on this kind of this next group because, like you said, those top five guys are going to be gone well before we get another shot at them. Um, Braylon Trice would be the guy that I'd keep my eye on. I would love if he fell to the second round, I'd run that to the podium. He would be I agree. The perfect fit. So let me give you a, a Washington based scenario. Yep. <laughs> the Giants take let's see. Let's say they take a quarterback for round one. Whoever. Mm-hmm. Now you're sitting at the 30. 30- fifth overall pick, let's say. And on the board are um, Adonai Mitchell, the wide receiver from Texas, Braylon Trice, the edge rusher from Washington, and Troy Fountainow, the tackle from Washington. Those are your best three players on the board. Who are you taking? I had to avoid interrupting you to scream Braylon Trice, but Braylon Trice, Braylon Trice, Braylon Trice. I'm with you. And it's a, I don't, I, 
yeah, I'm with you. I'm just saying it's 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 such a good class that you're gonna have like really good players there that you're gonna be looking at being like shit. Who do I take? Um, yeah, and you probably you probably can't go wrong, but you definitely can't go wrong with an edge rusher at that position. That's the thing. Like you, a guy who can impact the game as a pass rusher, there is high value. And I think from what I, it seems, there's a drop off after these top guys for at least from first look. So. If you can get one of those top guys, be all over it. But I mean, maybe it changes my answer there. If uh, probably wouldn't, because I think pass rush is important, and I really like Baron Tice. But if we went after Daniel Hunter or something, maybe it would change my answer there. Um, makes it less of a need, which is the idea of making a move like that. But uh, exactly, that's why you want to go get a guy like Daniel Hunter, um, or conversely, a guy like Michael Onuenu, or or him and like a swing tackle. You want to get these guys in free agency to shore up your roster so you're not feeling pressured to take somebody to fill that need on draft day. You're just looking at these guys and saying, I have them graded a certain way, and I'm taking the guy that I graded a particular way. That's all. Yep. Gar- garden Edge is where I'd spend my money in, in free agency. Agreed. All right. Um I will make one more comment on edge before we move on. I think it's imperative that not only the Giants get an edge too, but I think they really need a like a hand in the dirt power edge. Um, Braylon Trice does fit that; he fits that mold. Um, but I do think that Kayvon Thibodeau is more of your like true stand-up outside linebacker. He can play with his hand in the dirt, but I think he's best when he's coming off the edge, truly. With you know, not in a three-point stance, able to use his first step and his speed right off the bat. So. I think it would it would serve the Giants well to complement that with a guy who's more of a power pass rusher from the edge, like a Braylon Trice. Just something I would consider to be a good thing to have. I agree. All right. Let's go to the next roof, which is interior D-line. So here's the status of the Giants' interior D-line. It's actually not that bad. Um, so you have Dexter Lawrence. Best defensive lineman in football right now, period. Um, playing at that level, at least. Um, locked up for five years, I think, four years. He's good. You traded Leo to get a second and a fifth. So you got to fill that hole. But you have DJ Davidson under contract for another couple of years. And you have Jordan Riley under contract for another three years. Now, Riley hasn't seen a lot of playing time. But they're very high on the kid. So you have a couple of guys there who are basically just big blocks in the run game, right? They're they're just they just eat blocks and they try to absorb the run game. That's their job. But you have that. Um you have decks who can pretty much do everything. Pass rush like an edge rusher. Stop the run. <sighs> There's some good free agents on the market. There's some really good draft picks that could fill that role. How are you approaching this? One other one I want to mention too, I believe uh, Nunez Broches signed a oh yeah three year deal with us, I believe. So yeah, I forgot about him. Yeah, he'll be here too. So yeah, we have a solid depth room, but we are losing Leonard Williams, and that is where we need to replace it. We need to add another another high end, the at least potential high end defensive lineman. I think I think that would be a really big benefit. To really stacking this defensive line. When you have guys like Kayvon Thibodeau and Dexter Lawrence, I think adding good players around them to is an important thing to do to really take advantage of your strengths as a team. Uh with that said, I am I am attacking this through the draft. There there are some options in free agency that we have written down here that interest me is like a Chris Jones, and you definitely could make an argument if he shakes loose for the same thing as Daniel Hunter, where he's just a great player. He'll make you a better team. So I'm not going to poo poo on Chris Jones at all. Like that, I would not be mad. You make the same arguments you made for Daniel Hunter in ways. Christian Wilkins, who is a teammate of uh, of Dexter Lawrence, is one of the best run stopping defensive tackles in the NFL. He had almost a hundred tackles last year. Like just insane for an interior defensive lineman. Very good player. And he also has pass rush ability. Um and everyone we mentioned we had written here is Javon Kinlaw. He's been pretty much a bust since he came to the league, but you know, that's kind of an upside 
player that you potentially could bring in based off his draft status. He wouldn't be that expensive. But uh, I think where I stand on this is when you have, assuming again, assuming he's here, when you have a guy like Andre Patterson on your team, you can you take advantage of that and you take a high quality, great defensive lineman and you let him develop that guy and just have two stud defensive line in the middle of that defense with Dexter Lawrence and whoever you get. And I think that I think with this with a day two pick, I would I would attack that with some of the talent that's here. Uh how do you how do you feel about it? Same way. Um, I would probably spend my money on an edge rusher and draft a lineman. Um, and, and the reason I say that partially is because you've already paid your defensive lineman. And I, I don't really believe in doubling up on cash in the same position group at a high dollar amount. Um, you haven't paid an edge rusher yet. And yes, Kayvon Thibodeau was going to get paid at some point, but you could, you know, you could stagger a contract. If you, sign, if you sign an edge rusher now so that their hits on the cap are a little bit different. Um, but at D-line, you really need to draft somebody. And you don't – here's the thing. You have Andre Patterson, at least for now. You have Dexter Lawrence. You don't need to hit, like, a pass rush hitting home run right off of day one with this pick. And you can get a guy who's just talented, who you think Andre Patterson can work with and develop. Um, and so you don't need Johnny Newton, who's a first-round pick. You just – you don't need to spend a first-round pick on him as good as he is. The guy you and I both loved, um, who has basically drifted a little, I wouldn't say he's fallen, but he's drifted on the draft boards a little bit, is Chris Jenkins from Michigan. Yep. Why is he drifted? Because he just hasn't produced a lot of sacks and hasn't been as amazing in pass rush yet. But he's a lot still. Of last year stuff. Yeah. And this may be just who he is, right? It's entirely possible. This is just the player he is. That he's just not a very good pass rusher, but he's a really, really, really great run defender. Um, you know, he's the guy who I described having like that insane leverage, freak athlete, low to the ground. I just watch him play, and I think to myself, if this guy had Patterson, who could teach him just a few things, you could see him becoming a like dominant pass rusher. Yeah, man, I I'm still a huge fan of Chris Jenkins and I think it's trending towards where you could get him with that Seattle Seattle pick which would be incredible. Imagine trading Leonard Williams and you end up with with Chris Jenkins with that pick. Yeah. And yeah. like yeah. for anybody who didn't listen to our interior defensive line episode, like Chris Jenkins is a freak. He is like a what what do they call him again? The, the manimal or something like that. Oh, the mutant. The mutant. That's what it was. They call him the mutant. And, oh, yeah, he's the mutant of all mutants, Harbaugh said. And <laughs> he, and like, he has uh, Jenkins' shuttle and three cone times are both two tenths of a second faster than any interior defensive lineman last year with a 7.163 cone and a 4.33 shuttle. This reported. Raw jump of nine feet eight inches, vertical jump of thirty four inches. Um, he's doing his Turkish get ups. I know you talked about that in a defensive line episode of one hundred and seventy pounds. Um, just uh, just an absolute freak show. Um, he did thirty two reps on the bench. Uh, like the number he was number six on Feldman's freak list. He he. This guy is. Just a total monster, and he and he's just with that. He's a very good football player. He is a a technically sound, great run stopper. I think ultimately, you get Andre Patterson to work on on Chris Jenkins' hands and help him become more of a pass rusher. He has legitimate like top interior defensive lineman in the NFL type potential with his athleticism and where where he is already as a run stopper. If Andre Patterson can develop him into a pass rusher, he, he could do scary things next to Dexter Lawrence. And conversely, another guy who's higher up on most boards um, because he's a great pass rusher, but he's not a complete player in his run game is Leonard Taylor of Michigan, who might find himself. Yeah, he, he might find himself into the first round. Um, yeah, I could see it. 
or maybe he yeah. falls into the early part of the second round. But he's a guy like has immense upside. He's probably got the most upside of anybody here, to be honest. And he's another one like you just say you're already a pretty good pass rusher. I'm going to develop your your run stopping game with Andre Patterson, and boom, you have a stud. So I agree with you. Overall, the strategy here is probably you have depth, you have guys, and you have the best player in the league. You know, at least at his position on your team, you have him under contract for several years. You don't need to spend money here. You just got to draft another good player and let your coach work with them. Yeah. And, and it's I a good think, class. And I think given Dexter Lawrence, given Andre Patterson, you are in a great spot to bring in a young player and just let him develop. And I think he's going to look better than like he would in other spots. And you're going to really be able to get uh, a young producing lineman. And it's just a great spot to do it. And I'm, yeah. I really hope we, we uh, address that position because I think it would help this roster immensely. And we'll get into some of the other guys that we could mention. People are going to say, why didn't you mention this guy and that guy? Yeah, but there are a lot of players we'll have to get to um, yeah. in the draft. Um, well, let's just say, but the, strat- the strategy here is what we're saying. Sign your edge rusher, draft your lineman. I think that would be the optimal scenario here. That'd be playing the strengths of the draft. And the free agency class. Yeah. And the free agency class. And just the team. I, I think it hits all three. Yep. All right. Let's move on. Second level defenders. Middle linebackers. All right. This is a whole different conversation than I thought we'd yeah. be having <laughs> six weeks ago. Um, we have two really good inside linebackers. Just it, it seemingly happened overnight. But we went from having yeah. none to having maybe one, to having two really good ones in Bobby O'Karake and Micah McFadden. They have earned the starting inside linebacker job. This is where who the defensive coordinator is is going to really, really, really dictate what you do. 100%. Because if if you go to a 4-3 system, a, a base 4-3, especially with a guy like Frazier, who runs a lot of even fronts, meaning four down linemen, and he runs a ton of pressures and different zones out of base – then he's going to want a linebacker, a third linebacker that he can rely on to kind of do everything, you know? Yeah. And so he's going to shift O'Karaki over to middle linebacker. He's going to have, he's going to have uh, McFadden playing one of the outside linebacker positions, you know, and he's going to want somebody else who can do a lot. So in many ways, I actually think that if we go to that system, it benefits a guy like Isaiah Simmons to make yeah. a case to be re-signed by the Giants. And I think that's where this discussion begins. You already have O'Karake and you have McFadden under contract. You have uh, Darian Beavers under contract for another couple of years. We'll see how he's doing with his help. But you have Simmons through the end of this year, but not he's a free agent after this. And you got the draft. And I'm going to recap the draft for you real quick with linebackers. It was our, I think it was our least watched episode. Um, <laughs> and I think for good reason. <laughs> um, you got Jeremiah Trotter and Barrett Cotter. Uh, Barrett, Barrett Carter, both linebackers from Clemson at the top of the class. And then you got a drop off. Um, you do have Junior Colson from Michigan, who's very solid, but there's not a lot of guys in this group that are like exciting. You know, like just, yeah. Danny Stutzman was, was somebody that we, we put as a my guy, but he, he may not declare. Tommy Eichenberg is there. Yeah, he's solid, but there's nothing spectacular there. And he's probably not great in coverage. So, this is not a group where I'm reaching for a player. And you got two good ones. You probably need a third. Are you paying Isaiah Simmons? That, let's start the discussion there. And how much if you are? Ultimately, I'll let that come down to the defensive coordinator and how they view um, him in their system. I like Simmons. I think you know he's already been here. I think he's I would I like to what he's been as a teammate. I like his upside, and I think that he would be decently cheap. I think you could get him for like four or five million a yeah, year. Yeah, I was and in I the think, same range. I, and I think that's a good price for what he brings. He can do a lot of things for you, and especially if you move to a four three, and he's going to start for you. I don't know if uh, that's the next defensive coordinator will want. But 
I'm definitely interested in bringing back Isaiah Simmons. Really interested if somehow Wink stays. But um, what about yourself? Yep, I pay him four or five million. I I, I would be happy paying Isaiah Simmons. Uh, bring him back. Doesn't mean you don't try to draft someone or try to you know get a UDFA or something. But I think I would bring him back because I think he's a useful cog in any system. Uh, but specifically, if we go to a, like a four man even front, he's a very versatile player. And I think he, he can stay on the field and do good things. So I would, the way I'd look at this room is I would try to re-sign him and go from there. Now, one thing I'll say for, as far as the draft, I've been doing, messing around with a lot of mock drafts. And a guy I've been seeing staring me in the face in the third round a lot who I haven't pulled the trigger on is a guy we were both really big fans of. And that's Jeremiah Trotter. We both were huge fans of his game. And in a 3-4 with two really good interior uh, interior linebackers on this roster, I haven't felt I should pull the trigger on that just because of where we are. But if we are adding another starting linebacker and he's sitting there just based off of how I value him as a player, I I would definitely be open to something like that. I think he ends up going earlier in that because he's a really good player. But, yeah, uh, but third round, if he's sitting there still, I would I would be I would be here giving a four three for Jeremiah Trotter. I wouldn't oppose it. He's a good football player. Yeah. But I think um, the over, the over the overarching sentiment is here is just re sign Simmons or somebody like yeah. Simmons. I think yeah, I agree. And I think you should, you know, linebackers aren't expensive. You can bring in another starting linebacker, even if you're switching to a four three to kind of hold things down. Simmons is a guy that I would be a fan and advocate for, but uh, ultimately, I I would be open to drafting a linebacker. Just don't force it if you're going to a four three because you, there's a need more for another star linebacker. But I really and I'm still open to it in a three four, but it really isn't something that we need to prioritize because we have two really good players in Bobby Okereke and Mike. That, especially Bobby O'Carrick. I agree. All right. Let's let's do our DBs. Um, I don't think this will take terribly long, but let's start with the cornerback. Right now we have Deontay Banks under contract looking like a quarterback one. We have Cordell Flott under contract for another couple of years looking like a solid nickel corner. He's developing into one at least. Hmm. I, we have Trey Hawkins who we just drafted in the sixth round. He's under contract, but he has looked not so great this year. Jory Jackson is a free agent. He's probably gone. Um, yep. Are we drafting someone? Are we drafting him high? How are you approaching cornerback? Cornerback's an interesting one, man. We, we've, we've spent a good bit of draft capital on corner between Watt, you know, two years ago and spending a first round pick in Banks this last year. Uh, I think that I would probably sign a cornerback of some level, just a guy that, you know, can play outside that. So again, kind of like how we been talking about other positions, just giving yourself the best opportunity to go into the draft without feeling that you have to draft something is the, the best case scenario. Um, it's not a position I'd probably spend on. I would just probably get somebody that I feel okay, at least spot starting outside. Um, I think Trey Hawkins has shown that he's a guy that you have trusted to start this year. Doesn't mean you want to rely on it if he's the same player he was this year, but you know, you never expected him to be a starter this year and he and he's done that, which is a, a positive where you know he's he was a traits guy who you're hoping to develop. He might take a big step next year, you just not, can't necessarily count on it. Uh, but I would probably sign some sort of average cornerback you know the the morose of the world like we did before like doesn't have to be him that's not even who i'm advocating for but somebody along those lines uh and then i would look to draft a corner i think uh a guy again it, it depends so much on who our defensive coordinator is we brought up a guy like josh newton who we thought was a great fit for the giants but Obviously, if Wink Martindale isn't here, that changes who we're looking for as a cornerback. 
So um, I don't know. How do you feel about it? I do think we should draft someone. I really do. I just don't think we have a day one problem at cornerback. Yeah. Um, nor do I think yeah. I'm convinced it's a day two problem. It might be an early day three problem. Um, th- this is all based on Deontay Banks emerging as a very, very reliable, solid corner. If he continues the trajectory he's on, he's looking at being a top 10 quarterback in the NFL. You know, he's on that trajectory. Cordell Flott looks like he's going to be a serviceable nickel corner. I don't know how good he's going to get, but he looks pretty decent. You need a CB2. People find CB2s on day three, man. They really do. Yep. They don't spend a lot of money in free agency, and they find them on day three. And they just build them in. And again, DBs are somewhat, you know, it depends on what kind of system you're running, you know, in terms of how they'll they'll, they'll play. But <clears throat> I don't think we need to spend a top draft pick on this. So personally, I'm not spending a lot of money on it. I'm not spending a top draft pick. I'm just kicking back and waiting for the top of day three and seeing who's there. Yeah, because ultimately, whether it was a need, like whether, let's say, I go Dory Jackson is back. He won't be. But just to say, like, even if he was, I would still be drafting a cornerback because you can't have enough good cornerbacks. And that's nope. a position that I hope we continue to attack. And like you said, day three, you know, hopefully, you know, Trey Hawkins maybe can take the next step and be a be a guy for us next year and we can develop our next Trey Hawkins this year. We can keep attacking it that way over and over and over again. That's what great organizations do. Um, we'll see if we can create that type of pipeline but that's one i would like to try to start here i agree again i don't know who the dc is and i don't know how they're going to fit but i i agree with your assessment um yeah it's it's hard to kind of pick who we'd want to be giants right now without knowing what type of system we're going to run it was easier to try to talk about this when we had an idea that we thought wink martindale would be here but that definitely changes things. Let's go to our last position group. We've gone through all of them. I'm not, we're not going to go into special teams. But our last position group is yeah. safety. Um, and this is really interesting um, because you have Xavier McKinney as an impending free agent, but he's playing great right now. You have a guy like Jason Pinnock who came on the team and is under contract for another few years. And he's really played very well as both a box safety and sometimes in coverage, but he's just been really solid for a guy who is fifth or sixth round pick cut by the Jets after a year. Um, Looks like a solid football player. Um, You got Dane Belton, who's under contract for two more years, but you know, he's very limited. He's kind of like a, he's that, that cash safety, right. From the Iowa system. You have to be in the right system for him to be really impactful. Um, And that's kind of it. So number one, are you paying Xavier McKinney and how much are you paying him? To, com- to continue the uh, the building of this safety room. Um, and how are you approaching the draft? Yeah, so it's tough with Xavier McKinney. He, you know, he's really after, I know some Giants fans were getting tired of him. I think the Giants were starting to get tired of him at one point where, you know, he, he just kept showing up in the headlines and, you know, wasn't exactly being the star that we all hoped he would be. He was a solid player, but he wasn't, you know, being a game changer. And that hasn't been the case the last four weeks or so. He's, he's been a leader on this defense and he's been making plays. I think he's really made a good case for the giants to bring him back and why he's important to this defense. The issue is he has a very good agent and he's going to be targeting top safety money. I would not give Xavier McKinney top safety money. I wouldn't. Um, I think the ideal number I'd be looking at for him was something like twelve million a season, something like that. I might be able to go as high as something like fourteen on the high end. I wouldn't feel great about it, but like I wouldn't dismiss that. Um, but I wouldn't go any higher than that personally. Uh, how do you feel? I think we should sign him. Um. A couple of reasons. One, his value because of his lack of ball production over the course of his contract is just going to be subdued to some extent. I don't think he can realistically walk into a GM's office and say, "Give me sixteen million a year," and not get told no. You know, like I think his market is going to be in that low end of ten million a year up to a high end of like fourteen million a year. Somewhere in there is where his market's probably going to be. 
Agreed. Um, so if that's the case, just pay him. He's a good football player. He's an impactful yeah, football player. You didn't trade him when you could have. Make him the offer he needs to stay as a giant and keep building your safety room. That's how I look at it. Nobody else is getting paid in that room. And he's a very good player. Yep. Um, ultimately, he's going to hit free agency. So you're going to be competing with other people. We'll see what type of offers he gets out there. But um, I would definitely try to bring back to Xavier McKinney. Uh, with that said, how do you feel about drafting a safety? Where do you put that in the need if we bring back Xavier McKinney? And where do you feel it as a need if we don't bring back Xavier McKinney? So you know my draft philosophy. It's take your quarterback round one and go BPA the rest of the way. I mean, because I, I don't think that the Giants should be in the business of drafting for need. I really don't Agreed. believe that. Um, I think they should be taking best player available and building up their roster. Um, I've always said, like, I really hated the way Joe Shane took $55 million in cash space and just burned through it so quickly. I understand some of the moves he made, but one of the reasons you want cap space is not just so you can keep signing everybody, but the reason you want cap space is so you can keep intelligently building your roster when you have a strong class of edge rushers, whatever it may be. Right. Um, yep. Or that you add depth at the, uh, you add depth in your interior offensive line or at safety and you have good quality players on your roster that you can pay for because you're not overpaying somebody. When draft day comes in and you have the makings of a solid team, you're not worried about missing out on any particular player. You're just sitting there and saying, who's the best player? Who's going to help my team the most? I'm going to take that guy. And so that's how I would approach safety. I wouldn't be sad if they signed McKinney and didn't draft anybody. Um, if they did draft somebody, you know, another Michigan player worth targeting is Rod Moore. He's probably going to be there at the back end of round two. Maybe early at round three, depending on how the board shakes. I've Mike's, seen him low on some people's boards, man. That's weird. Yeah, I mean, it depends on on. on I don't know what they're looking for, but he's a well coached player. Like you, just like I, all I like guys. Rod Moore, but I've seen him low he, on some boards. It's very strange. He can play center field. He can play two deep safety. He's a scheme versatile kind of a player. He's quick to break on the ball. He's smart. He's like what you look for in a safety. Um, yeah, his his teammate is. Picking up steam, man. Like, have you been following him? The uh, which, which kid? I'm trying to think. Uh, Sanderson, Mike Sanderson. Like the, I'm gonna try to. I'm I'm gonna butcher his name, but Sanderson, I think, is the name. He's the, is that nickel the younger back. kid. No, so he's a converted wide receiver. Okay. Um, Mike Sanderson. That's how you say it. Okay. okay. So. He's about 5'10", 5'11", 182. He's not the biggest guy. But he's been playing nickelback this year. He used to be a wide receiver. He converted. And this dude is just balling out right now, playing nickelback and like kind of like free safety slash nickelback. Like he's been amazing. Uh, and because he's a former wide receiver, he has the hands of a wide receiver. He has the right running instincts of a wide receiver. So he's been climbing up draft boards. I mean, he was viewed as a day three guy. Now he's... People are talking about him like a day two guy, but the point is both of those Michigan players, they play slightly different styles, but they are the kind of guys that you add them to your room. If they're the BPA, it makes your secondary a lot better. Yeah. Yeah, man. Do you have any other thoughts um, on this? A... Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what you said, where just kind of go BPA, and I, I'd be willing to take a safety as high as the second round if, you know, the talent match the pick i mean there's some good guys in this draft tyler newbin i would have no problem taking the second round cameron kitchens i would have no problem taking a second round those are really good players and even if we brought in like uh uh we brought back xavier mckinney i i would still be open to it because uh pinnock is a good player but he'd be a great safety three like that would be a great role for him um but i'm also okay with him starting if worse comes to worse because he's already started this year and, you know, you you have, if we lose McKinney, like you said, you can always go back out to free agency. A lot of these safeties usually hang out there for a while. You saw that with, uh, like, a Logan Ryan, like, a, a few years ago we did. A lot of some of these safeties will hang out after the draft to get a pick. So, if things don't go right, you could always go readdress and see who's out there. But, um, uh, 
Yeah. This this Not is another else. position. I mean, this is another position where like it's it's who's your DC? You know, yeah. It's going to make a huge difference. Like, does he run nickel? Does it? You know. So, um, Leslie Frazier, like his that's his calling card. He runs nickel a ton, and he runs a lot of like four two five, like the big nickel, the old uh, Perry Fuel defense. You know, he yeah. runs stuff like that all the time, and he needs he needs extra safeties. So, and, you know, the reason it worked in Buffalo is because they had a deep room of quality safeties. So it, it's a big part of it. So I w- even if they sign Xavier McKinney, I wouldn't put it past the Giants to take like a day two safety here. If he if the if the value matches up, I can see it working. Yeah, I totally agree. And you know, getting a guy like Tyler Newbin or Kitchens would not be a bad pick at all. Really good players. So uh yeah, the position I think kind of we said the the big the big thing will be Xavier McKinney. And how they address that, but it's one of those positions where we are not advocating where we have to go safety, but we would not be against it at any point either. It's there's not too much to say there. Absolutely. All right. Well, that is our full position by position breakdown. I mean, I'm not going to go through all of them again, but we did quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, offensive line, edge, interior D line, linebacker, cornerback, safety. Um. Take home synopsis point. There's still a lot of unknowns on this roster, um, and they seem to be growing, going by the day with a lot of free agency issues pending. I would like the Giants to hold on to their cap space. That's the bottom line. Um, I would like them to retain it and not guarantee it to to Barkley or anybody else who may not be part of the future, and keep it in reserve to sign quality free agents that are out there to minimize their their roster building needs on draft day. That's my take home point here is that when you look at all the different needs they have limited cap space, a quality draft class, you don't want to go into that draft day needing stuff. You want to have filled what you need to through free agency, not overspend at certain positions. Go from there. What about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm with you. And I think, when you go into this draft, hopefully planning to take a quarterback, that's going to open up a little bit of what you can do with some of these long-term contracts. Because if you can plan for Daniel Jones' contract to be off the books, you can structure these contracts a little bit differently. You can push that money into next year and the year after that with, you know, the, or, you know, in 2025 and 2026 with intentions of, of Daniel Jones contract not being on the books. So, uh, it's gotta be, they gotta be, you know, uh, aware of everything that they're doing and kind of be, uh, react. They gotta prepare well for this. All right, man. Well, uh, that's basically an episode. There's no college football next week. Um, the giants are back and back in action, uh, playing, you got to wait till Monday night um, playing the now red hot Green Bay Packers uh, in Monday Night Football, who just beat the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, and are we still in Tankathon? I don't know. But <laughs> yeah. we're, I think we kind of are, but we'll see how it goes. Um, but uh, there's no college football. That's kind of it. Um, we appreciate you guys. Another reminder please like at He's a Giant Pod, follow it. Uh, that's our pod uh, handle on Twitter. Follow me, Sal, at Queens underscore guy. Follow Monty at Monte Cristo at M-O-N-T-E-C-R-I-5-T-O. Um, we appreciate you guys. Yeah, I'm going to let Monty close it out. Do you have any closing thoughts here, bro? Um, yeah. I just, one thing I wanted to say is uh, you apparently don't support our troops, Army, Navy, this this weekend. Don't forget. Oh. You still got some fuck. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> I always forget that one. <laughs> Sorry. But, Sorry, service folks. But, Thank um, you for your service. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, that's all I have. Um, we'll catch you guys again later this week. We just wanted to finish up the State of the Giants. And, uh, you know, thank you guys all for tuning in and the support you've given us. We're over a thousand views again on the first day of the Giants. So again, just appreciate you guys so much for all your support. We do appreciate you guys. You guys have a good night. Go Giants. Go Giants.